we'll just wait a moment and see if we've actually gone live. All right, I think we are live. That's what I'm seeing anyway. Um, so welcome Girl Scouts to Girls in the Woods Week. This is day two of Girls in the Woods Week. Um, and the whole week we're celebrating women who have outdoor careers. Um, and we're so happy to have a series of live panel question and answer sessions. Uh, if you know, don't know me, I'm Angie Madsen, the Outdoor Program Specialist here at Girl Scouts of Oregon in Southwest Washington. But tonight's not about me at all. Instead, Georgia Bossy, the Girls in the Woods director and longtime Girl Scout, is going to lead us in a Q&A session with four women who have experience in wildlife biology and botany, which is the study of plants. <laughs> so uh, please type any questions at all that you have for this group in the comments, um, and you can let us know your grade level and troop number if you'd like. But right now, I'm just going to pass it on to Georgia to start us off. Well, welcome. Uh, glad to have an audience and glad to have these wonderful women here to answer questions. We got a few questions before tonight, uh, so I'll start out with those and then we'll look for your questions in the chat. So the first question that we're going to ask is, what is your favorite season of the year and why? Anybody want to start out with an answer to that? And if you could introduce yourself when you answer your first question, that would also be great. Let us know who, who you are, where you're from, what you do. Cheryl. Hi, I'm Cheryl. And I'm the one who is the botanist, uh, studied plants. And uh, so I think spring is my favorite season. That's when the plants start coming out. And that's when the birds come back. And uh, that's when you really feel like being outdoors. Elaine, would you like to? Sure, spring is my favorite too. <laughs> um, for all the reasons that Cheryl said, there's lots of things happening in the spring. Um, every day is something new is emerging. There's new bees, there's new birds, there's different flowers. The weather's getting better. Um, the promise of summer is coming and lots of things to do outside. And yeah, it's definitely my favorite season as well. Oh, and I should say, I'm, I, I, um, I'm a wildlife biologist, and I work for the U.S. Forest Service. Thank you. Barb. So uh, maybe this is Barb. I'll give a different, <laughs> uh, I worked in, uh, I'm a wildlife biologist, and I've worked with both Elaine and Cheryl here in the Northwest, but I also worked in northern Minnesota and northern New England. And sometimes in many ways, I like the winter the best because in the winter, all the leaves are down and there's snow on the ground and you can get around really well on snowshoes and you can see the tracks of the animals and you can see everything because there's no leaves. And it's a very, very, even though it's cold, it's quiet and it's a very different experience to be out in the winter time. So. Okay, thank you, Julie. Unmute yourself. There. Trying to unmute my dogs. Or I mute my dogs. Um, <laughs> so, gosh, uh, springtime is my favorite season. It sounds real original. Um, I, I uh, spent a, a career doing a lot of indoor work, mapping and um, doing uh, community planning. And so I kind of came into being interested with, in birds in the springtime because we were doing a nesting survey for Swainson's Hawk. And now springtime is just magical to me because I become very in tune to the bird populations around me and, and birds are arriving from Central America and South America and they're, they're coming into my yard. And I just find that every year is amazing and magical and renewing. <laughs> so springtime. Yes. <laughs> Okay, the next question that was submitted is, what should I do now if I want to be a biologist someday? Um, and I'm just going to go the same order again. Cheryl, would you start us out on that? Um, besides being 
good in school and taking all the science and math that you can. Um, I think it's really important to have your sense of curiosity and observation and kind of maximize your times, whether it's going to parks or going camping or hiking or just being in the backyard and looking at things in your yard, but observing things and asking questions and why might that be there and maybe coming up with some thoughts on why you think it might be there or why it might be doing that. And uh, just kind of uh, highlight your sense of observation, seeing how things change, seeing what, what's there. Um, you could be kind of amazed to see uh, things that you think are just lawn are probably a lot of more flowers and bugs and stuff than you ever thought were there. Elaine. Uh, I would definitely echo being outside. Um, all of the really amazing wildlife biologists that I know, they spent lots of time when they were growing up outside and spending time just being out there. And the good thing about being outside, especially during the pandemic, is that it is a way to get out. Um, it's free, except for sometimes you have to, you know, have some kind of transportation cost to go, but. Um, Generally, it's something that you can do whether you're in your backyard or in this incredible state that we live in that has so much to do and so much to see close to home. And I think the other thing that I would add to that, um, looking a little farther down the road, is that I would, um, and it, this was uh, very helpful to me, I would look for opportunities to volunteer. I think you have to be a little bit older, maybe, you know, 12 or older, but um, look for opportunities where you can uh, volunteer with organizations that do conservation work. And um, certainly the Girl Scouts can give you that opportunity, but um, Something like the Audubon Society of Portland has some incredible programs, um, no matter what your age. And you really get a chance to see what things are going on behind the scenes. Behind, behind the scenes. Whoops, there's a little echo there. And, um, and you'll meet some wonderful people. So I would say um, both of those things would be important things to work on as you um, think about becoming um, a person that works in the outdoors. Hey, thank you, Elaine. Barbara? Well, I, I, I echo what uh, Cheryl and Elaine said, and I think if you can, if you don't have access to uh, somebody you know personally, they can provide those opportunities, definitely look at the local programs like the Girl Scouts, Audubon, for providing those programs so that you can get out and do things, whether it's volunteering, whether it's shadowing, um, and take even take classes. I, I think part of it is just getting exposed to people who are knowledgeable and that you'll kind of treat as role models in the future. And, it's, and, and if it can be out of doors, that's great. And the other thing I would suggest to the girls is uh, because I work with more advanced level biologists right now. People are trying to get into their career and um, get jobs is one thing we keep hearing is they want people that can work with people. So if you have a job or experience or opportunity like Elaine suggested where you're volunteering and you're learning to communicate, how to use media, how to talk to people, how to relate wildlife and natural resource, natural history concerns, that's a big plus because a lot of people in the future that turns out to be a big part of their job is learning how to communicate with the public. So that's that's one of my thoughts. Yeah, well, I sure agree with what everybody was saying as well. Um, seeing how was work kind of stuck a little bit less um, in the public right now and being more at home. I have a, um, and I wasn't sure what age that um, the, the people would be watching, but there's two um, 
I had been working this spring with a bunch of bird boxes and I was gonna share my screen and show the baby wrens that I took a picture of, but this is a bird box with a um, lid on it. And it's and there were uh, two families of wrens that nested in here. And there's actually a program online. So even if you haven't been able to volunteer or anything at Audubon, there it's just um, nestwatch dot org and you can go on there and they actually give you instructions for making good safe nest boxes for the birds and it's really fun to watch them and they say that it's actually okay to open the nest box once a week take a quick picture or a quick peek the only exception being when the babies are getting ready to fledge so um it's just a real great way to get kind of some hands-on experience in the life cycle of young birds. And then in the winter time, there's another program called feederwatch.com where you can actually get experience taking data on birds that are right outside of your window. So those are just a couple kind of practical basic ideas of ways, but gosh, if, yeah, volunteering is, is just a wonderful way to connect with people. And you'll have a lot of fun too. It's really <laughs> fun to do that. One other place that you can go for volunteering um, or getting experience is the Oregon Zoo. Um, yes, they, yeah. There's some great, pro great programs and oftentimes they'll have carts out with things for you to touch and ask questions about. So the zoo is another place to go. And yeah, then I was worked at the zoo when he was young and he just had a blast. It was um, really fun to meet new people. Um, he helped out with the bugs. And um, yeah, I want to make a plug for the bugs too, because there's a Xerces Society that um, works with bugs. And so if you're really into bees or worms or mussels, um, the Xerces Society is for you. And not many people think about those kinds of creatures, but um, there's a whole wonderful wilderness. Yeah, and I was also thinking of uh, wildlife rehab organizations up there. I don't, not familiar with what you all have up in Oregon, but um, I'm sure that there's, if you really feel like you want to touch animals, <laughs> um, rehab is a way to become very familiar with individual animals too. And Audubon Society has a program, and uh, I think you have to be at least 12 to help right. out. But, um, yeah, the Audubon Society here in Portland, Portland Audubon is a program if you like to do those kinds of things. I remember meeting Ruby, the turkey vulture up there once. <laughs> <laughs> is this visible? That's, yes. Yes, that's, yes. that's what uh, Elaine was talking about, the Xerxes Society. And they're now it's not obvious how to station, but they're based right here in Portland. Yes. And I would echo to um echo to um about you know doing your best in school. You know, doing your best That's in your school job right now, and you're gonna That's learn a lot of right things. now, and you're gonna learn a lot of mm -hmm. and and your teachers have something to teach you. Okay. Um, another question. Um, another question. I think Barb, you're echoing us. Um, anyway, another question is, if you could explore anywhere in the world, where would you go? Well, I'm just very curious about what I grew up knowing as the Queen Charlotte Islands, but are called Haida Gwaii up in Canada. And uh, I recently learned about a volunteer opportunity up there. I think it's for people over 18, but to go actually and work at a research station up there. And I'm kind of interested in Haida Gwaii particularly because I've been um, working with these little owls, these Northern Sawwet owls on a volunteer basis and uh, read that there's actually a, either a subspecies or a population of Northern Sawwet owls up there 
that unlike here where they prey on voles and field mice and a few insects, they're actually in the forest. These saw what owls actually are out on the beach eating apparently, I think, crustaceans. So I've just thought that Haida Gwaii would be a really interesting place to go. Plus, every, when, you, when you go up to British Columbia, everybody mentions how wonderful it is up there. Or the biologists do, anyway. <laughs> so that's where I'd go. This is Cheryl, and I've, uh, I have gone to many places in the world. Um, one of the places that was the richest in plant species, uh, that is the most plant species that I saw, was in Mongolia, which kind of seems like a strange place, but there are some very wild places there. And it was amazing that uh, I walked out behind our camp and I was almost afraid to put my feet down. There were so many different plants and every few steps that I would take, there would be new plants. Um, so I think that that's the richest place I have seen with plants. Um, but I have also been to Africa and, and that is the place in the world where there's uh, most of the animals and lots of birds, you know, even kinds of birds that we have here like starlings that are beautiful uh, compared to our kind of drab starlings. Um, and I've been to Iceland uh, where the plants are really short and low to the ground like they are in, uh, in other Arctic and boreal places. Um, again, you know, very different and, and very affected by their geology. So those are a couple of thoughts. Ar, would you like to address that question and, and turn yourself back on? Unmute yourself. Barb, unmute yourself. There we go. Am I ready? There, okay. there you go. Yeah. Okay, I, I, um, I've been to Mongolia too, and it was more for cultural reasons, but it's a fascinating country amazing country. If I was going somewhere for wildlife, uh, I'd probably put many of the Africa countries. And I've been to five or six there, because you know, Lane's been there with me. I mean, it's just amazing, including Madagascar. Madagascar is this large island off the east coast of Africa with lemurs and a very unique ecology because it separated from the mainland a long time ago. But I'd also put places that we don't often think of, like Borneo in Indonesia, for biodiversity and wildlife. There's both. There's places all over the world you can go for incredible wildlife, natural history, seeing outdoor uh, nature experiences, and I rate them all really highly. So I'm just going to quickly put in a plug for Tasmania, which is absolutely amazing. And I had a wonderful time meeting wildlife there. Um, let's see. Did I get all of you? Elaine, did you say something for us? Um, well, um, I mean, actually, my first choice is Oregon. I just think <laughs> Oregon is an amazing Oregon, awesome. <laughs> and um, but I guess my second choice would be Australia. Um, I've been there a couple of times. The animals there are just really, really different. Um, like, they don't have woodpeckers because the gum trees are so hard that a woodpecker couldn't peck a hole in them. And <laughs> so they have parrots that kind of are the same role in the ecosystem as woodpeckers, but the birds are just strange. There's no, you won't see crossover. Like if I go to South America, I'll see, you know, some South America, you know, some birds that I see here. But when I go to Australia, there's nothing that looks the same. Mm -hmm. And it's just mm -hmm. a really fascinating place. So I, I guess that would be my second choice after Oregon. Um, moving on, if you could, uh, well, I guess I've got 
the question about explore any place in the world. Um, do I have some additional questions here yet in the chat? Um, so um, I, it looks like we don't have another question from the chat. Uh, I have some questions that I to uh, ask. Um, and following up on what we just said, what is the most interesting animal you have seen or plant? Oh, wow. That's a tough one. I know. Hmm. I think about that one. I think of plants, the sundews and the carnivorous plants fascinate me the most. Uh, but there's some really amazing kinds of plants. And following up on talking about Australia, the marsupials there um, are just incredible too. Um, and the platypus, I think, is one of the most amazing creatures I've ever met. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pretty amazing. Well, I, I don't know if Georgia, I, there was a serious nomination that since they decided to train, uh, not have the civil war between OSU and University of Oregon is the name anymore. They were wanted to call it the platypus bull because it <laughs> had a duck bill. <laughs> I mean, they have both species. So I don't know if they've ever decided what they're gonna do, but they were talking about making it the platypus bull. That's interesting to know that. <laughs> Well, I, I don't know about the most interesting plant, but one that's kind of uh, kind of special is uh, called Menzesia. It lives in Eastern Oregon and it has a yellow flower that's kind of star shaped. But uh, the cool thing about it is that uh, many plants have hairs under their leaves and on their stems in different ways. And the Menzesia has hairs that kind of curl over. And so if you take a leaf of Menzelia and you throw it on your friend, it sticks. Somebody said to me that that's the original source of Velcro. <laughs> I thought we had the original source of Velcro on our property here. I think it's uh, a common name is Burr Churvel. I don't know what it is in Latin. <laughs> sticks to your stuff. Yeah, they stick. Mm -hmm. hmm. Uh, well, I think a sturgeon is a pretty amazing fish, um, and I've only seen one once in my life, but I think they live a very, very long time. And I did hear that after the Bureau of Reclamation built Shasta Dam, which is the biggest dam on the Sacramento River down here in California, um, it holds back water that's eventually sent to Southern California, that until uh, recently, and I don't know if they still exist, but sturgeon were still living in Shasta Lake and going up the Pitt River area to spawn. So I just found that quite amazing that they would live for decades in this man-made reservoir. Well, and they're so prehistoric looking. Where did you see one? In the Sacramento River, a friend of mine caught one. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. There are still some in the Willamette River in Portland and um, I like to swim a lot in the Willamette River and I have a dream that someday I'm going to be swimming across the river and a sturgeon is just gonna rise up. Now that's a, there's a dream. <laughs> they're really, pre, I mean, they're ancient creatures too. Yeah, yeah, and they look it. Yeah, they're very, very strange looking. But I still haven't seen one yet. <laughs> um. What animals or plants have you worked to protect and how? Oh. A lot. <laughs> I know I worked on a database with a couple of you, several databases actually, that were intended for that purpose. So. Yeah. 
Well, I know when I was working, it was pretty much whatever species needed protection. So I didn't, whether it was a spotted owl or a fish or a plant species, that was all kind of, I mean, it was interesting to find out there's a lot of different biology with each of those species, but once you start to work within the protection systems and the federal or state regulations or whatever the laws are, it's kind of um, a lot of the same in that you've got to learn to work within whatever processes allow you to help protect the species. So that's one of the things I learned. So, you know. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. That work. I tried that echo is bugging me there. I've, I've worked with um, protecting uh, bank swallows, which are a state listed species down here in California. The Swainson's hawk also, and um, Sierra Nevada um, foot, foothill and Sierra Nevada yellow legged frogs and um, various plant species also, because like you, it sounds like like you, Barbara, I worked in the regulatory arena. So we essentially had to survey for all of those species if an area was going to be developed or changed and make recommendations by consulting with the specialists. Cheryl, do you have some? Cheryl, and um, when I worked in the field in Eastern Oregon, um, I worked mostly with um, Malheur wire lettuce, which was the first plant that was listed as endangered in Oregon and the only place in the world that it exists is on a little hill in uh, Harney County, uh, just south of Malheur Lake, uh, not far from where the takeover was uh, a few years ago, um, south of Burns. Um, and it was the only place that that lived and it was thought that it was being, um, wasn't getting enough water because there was cheatgrass that was growing in its habitat. And so we did some experiments um, with weeding out the cheatgrass in some plots and not in others. And it did show that the, it did better when the cheatgrass was removed. Um, but as, as Barb said, um, when you're working with agencies like BLM and the Forest Service, um, you do deal with a lot of plants. And um, there was another group of plants um, that were listed at the same time that exist down uh, in the area of Eugene in the wetlands there. The Willamette Daisy, uh, Bradshaw's, uh, uh, Desert Parsley, um, and one other one whose name I'm forgetting. Um, oh, sorry, Lupinus sulfurius, uh, the, uh, uh, one of the lupins. Um, they, they grow in the same habitat, um, but they are endangered habitats because people developed the wetlands uh, in the past and have been doing so, and so they're losing habitat. But one of the important things is with that lupin um, is also the host for an endangered butterfly. Uh, and so that kind of shows you the interrelationship of the plants and the animals and their habitats and how uh, even though each of us deal with different things with wildlife and birds and plants uh, through ecology, we see that they're all connected. And uh, so uh, in dealing with one thing, sometimes you have to deal with other things as well. Okay, we're getting to 28. I'm gonna... Um asked you what led you to doing the kind of work that you're doing um, as kind of a final question. Well, I'll go first. I write um, where, what Elaine was talking about being outside as a little girl and loving nature and loving the snails and the birds and the beach and the turtles and just being outside is what brought me where I am today. Well, and I think I would just build on that, that yeah, the, 
enjoying that so much and then growing out of that is an interest in trying to make sure that protected or conserved and that, um, I mean, you care about the things that you love. And um, I, I think, yeah, spending time outside and loving it and wanting to do something to make sure that wonderful species that are in the world still stay around. Um, and I ended up working a lot on, with endangered species because of that. It's just hard to imagine a species winking out from the face of the earth because we didn't take care of it. And I, I think that's really what inspired my work. Uh, this is Cheryl and, and we, uh, I grew up in the country and I always loved going to the frog pond and going out in the woods, building forts and camps and uh, tracking rabbits in the snow uh, and just always loved being outdoors and s still do. My desk is cluttered with things because I'd rather be outside than do my inside stuff. Um, <laughs> And as, as I got going uh, in my career, I, I guess I still carried on with that and uh, did a lot of things that had me uh, walking through swamps and marshes and forests, identifying plants and mapping where they lived and what the habitats were. And while I was out there also seeing the frogs and the snakes and, and interesting bugs um, and and then in, in my work with BLM and Forest Service, um, getting to know the, uh, the more things like, like the slugs and snails and stuff. Um, so it just kind of all, all ran together, but uh, it was you know, mostly my love of outdoors and being outdoors that, and my curiosity and, and, uh, and following that. Barbara, do you want? for us and be sure to unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. But I, I you know, we all have that uh, same background where we love the out of doors. And then you go to college or your higher education and you make that option to get trained in wildlife or what natural resources or botany. But I think the young girls and young ladies in this call should realize it's not a big money-making decision. I mean, I don't know how other folks went, but I remember being a volunteer for a long time or working in minimum wage jobs or having to move every year to keep a job going. So I think you need to love the profession because it might not be easy to get a long-term job in the profession. And it, it's not to diminish it, but the reality is you want to be able to make a, a living and you know def decent lifestyle of your, your choice. So I think I think the the girls and ladies or young women on this call should realize it can be a tough haul to get a career job. I mean, we're all lucky we have jobs in the federal agencies and they gave us career jobs, but lots of times it's a lot of moving around, a lot of low income jobs, a lot of sacrifices personally to be able to do it. And I don't want to put it on a negative note, but I think that's very, a very real world nowadays, perhaps even more from when before then we got into the jobs. That's, that could be, a, got to be really dedicated, focused. You really want to do this, so. Yeah, that's a really good point, Barb. Yeah. And we're at 633. Angie, our... <laughs> yeah, thank you all so much. Thank you to Barb, Julie, Cheryl, Elaine, and Georgia, of course, um, for sharing your wildlife and plant experiences with us. Um, just for any Girl Scouts who like a quick recap like I do, I wrote down a couple things that I really loved um, that you all shared um, about how if you're interested in a career in wildlife biology or botany, 
uh, you definitely want to talk to your role models, um, look for outdoor volunteer opportunities, develop people skills, um, I liked how you said thinking about creatures that we don't often think about, so like mussels or slugs. Um, you can do simple things for now, like making bird nests, um, but always remember that the, that of the, remember the interconnectedness of nature and spend time outside caring for what you love. Um, and I think that'll shown through a lot in what you shared with us today. So thank you so much. Um, tomorrow, we'll be back with some more experts. We'll be chatting with mapping and archaeology experts. So you can tune in here on Facebook at 6 p.m. Pacific, um, or you can, of course, watch it later by uh, going to our Facebook videos. So feel free to share this link with anyone else in your troop or any friends that you have who are interested in plants or animals, because there's a lot to learn. <laughs> Thank you all so much talking with the girls and with me tonight. Much appreciated. It was fun. Thank you. It was, it was, it was great talking with the girls and great seeing old friends again. Have a good night.